Hello, multi Magnus Maltus Maximus, and thank you to Angelos Michael or Michael. I think it's Michael or Michael for the malt mention. I'm Ralphie in the Bothy. Whiskey time, matured spirits time. This is what I do here. It's thoroughly enjoyable, and I share my research with you in an extras because this is what this is 933 extras I'm talking about the quality of casks why we need to understand this we need to know more about casks we need to develop cask awareness particularly when we're nosing and tasting whiskies we need to be able to spot good cask influence we need to be understanding and appreciative of bad cask or poor cask influence because this helps to justify whether it's a good buy or not a good buy. See, there's two things that are changing whiskey. One is when it's produced in the pot stills. I'm talking about single malts here, but I'm also talking about grain whiskey, to be honest. Scotch, blended scotch as well, but really less focus in single malts. Uh, and that is that as technology improves and as distillers focus on improving yields and by yield of production of spirit what they really mean is yield of alcohol they don't mean yield of flavor but they still need to hold on to some flavor just enough flavor to keep the identity but the problem is when you over distill or whether when you produce too much alcohol from your yield of grain you, you make sacrifices and the sacrifice is that you've got a variety of grain, contemporary grain, which is easy to work with, gives you a great yield of alcohol, but the alcohol is coming from the breakdown of starch in the seeds of barley, and beside the carbohydrate, the starch, is um, the parts of the barley responsible for flavour, including the husk. Yeah. Husk can contribute to flavour. And I'll tell you exactly why, because when the husk goes into the kiln and you're peating a whisky, the husk will absorb the, absorb the smoke from the, the kilning process and contribute that peatiness back into the wash, into the wort, and then into the wash once it's fermented. But with modern technology and science, it's very easy for to distillers to, to get things so pinpoint accurate that in fact they're producing 2% more alcohol from the yield and therefore cutting costs, but they're losing 5% of flavour because you either get one or the other. Ideally you want both in harmony and balance. But the more you drive for alcohol, the more you lose the flavour. And with many modern techniques, particularly when they're industrialised, heavily industrialised, and you don't have people actively hands-on making whiskey anymore and using the experience and the, the judgement to, for example, to, to moderate, moderate things when you've got a summer, a summer month instead of a winter month. It's a very good example then what you have is over distillation. You have lovely, clean, fresh, new make spirit. And yet when you pop it in the cask, you get a less interesting and more boring matured result. That's what you get. The other side is casks. So here's the two basic ingredients which are going to deliver either a good whiskey or a bad whiskey the yield from the grain, the flavour from the grain, and the percentage of alcohol, most important, but they need to be balanced. And then the casks, are they good casks or bad casks? And so many casks fall in between, they become competent casks. They're fit for purpose. But unfortunately, for I'm noticing this. I'm, I'm just sharing this with you because I notice it. Modern casks tend to be engineered to produce safe results and not 
overly flavor complex results. So for example, you may have a cask, which isn't going to give much to the whiskey, but once it's been rinsed out with the special wash and preparation syrup, there's nothing illegal about it, as long as it's emptied out the cask and it becomes an empty cask, then you've got something external influencing the flavour. And this can happen, for example, I'm just going to give you an example so that you know exactly what I'm talking about here. So a wet cask come in, comes in from Spain, hogsheads. And you give the casks a shake and they're empty because they've been emptied of their sherry. But there's just a certain amount left inside to keep the cask wet, to keep the cask fresh. And so there may be, there's about a couple of bottles worth of sherry still inside the cask. Now the distiller can either absolutely tip them out to make sure every last drops out the cask or they can regard it as the fact that they've got empty casks because they ordered empty casks and it says empty casks in the invoice and therefore they can be treated as empty casks and if there's any residual previous content all the better. Particularly if that previous content has to be been, been made to their recipe. This is why good casks are very important for the really successful whiskies. The whiskies that we want to go out and buy again, the reason is slightly lower alcohol yield, more of a flavour yield. And then the cask that this flavoursome spirit has gone into has over time this dynamic of maturation and it produces something intense and complex and it doesn't have to be a first fill cask it can be a second or even a third fill cask but but it's giving the spirit enough time in the cask to let the cask work its magic so in a first fill cask you could leave a whiskey in it for 10 years you might not want to leave it any longer because you might get too much cask influence Alternatively, if you've got a second fill cask, or even a third fill cask, if there's been two short previous fills, you may say, I tell you what, it's going to take a while because there's not so much energy in the wood, there's not so much residual flavour due to previous fills of our single malt whisky. Therefore, we're going to leave this 18 to 21 years. And what we'll get is a more delicate result, which is spirit driven, less cask influence, but we'll get a different sort of single mould and therefore it can work wonderfully well. So just to give you a, a point of reference, there aren't that many seriously bad casks in the whisky industry. I mean, I'm talking seriously bad casks, totally rancid, totally stale, totally awful flavouring casks. They're not out there because the problem is you can have one of those casks will be enough to destroy an entire batch of single malt. So you were to put, if you were to put a really bad cask in with 50 good casks, that bad cask will bring all the other 49 good casks down dramatically. So what you have is a dis... And it happens, by the way, a discontinuation of whisky maturing in really bad casks. When it's identified, then the cask will be marked with the big red cross. Uh, customs and excise, excise will be approached, and yet it has happened. The customs and excise will give permission for a barrel of whisky to be flushed down the drain free of duty. It does happen. Not very often. See, with the quality of casks, it's not so much bad casks. It's just average casks. That's the main issue. Casks which they don't bring anything particularly dynamic to the whisky during maturation, but they don't really do much damage to it either. 
or alternatively you have an inert cask which over the years doesn't actually do that much to the whiskey in terms of maturation and, and let's just be absolutely clear about this whiskey is not made in distilleries new make spirit or cleric that's made in distilleries whiskey's made in warehouses and whiskey is more than three simple ingredients of water yeast and malted barley if it's single malt it's more than that it's cask influence and within cask wood you've got about 600 different chemicals but that can vary see the big problem is as i briefly mentioned but i'm going to repeat it not so much really bad casks as just mediocre casks because when some distilleries are operating to a severe budget the decision will be made in head office i tell you what spend less in the casks and we'll just paper over the cracks by spending more in marketing as and when we need it big mistake see the thing is if distilleries become too dependent on marketing then they're competing with every other distillery that's marketing based and marketing led and the messages just get boring after a while really really boring because they're so repeated and so uninspiring fine if you're a passive consumer you see a nice bright blingy box all good and when you taste the whiskey that tastes nice then they move on shove some ice into it fill it up with coca-cola it's all right it's a single malt with coca-cola in it but it's my birthday it's the sort of thing they come away with the passive consumers and there's i'm, it's, I'm not criticizing them because we all start as passive consumers but as time goes on as we start to do our self-imposed expensive apprenticeship learning about good whiskey what it is and how to identify it and what leads to a good whiskey we quite by default we understand what bad whiskey is and what leads to bad whiskey particularly in relation to an expensive price tag so to summarize now when you approach a cask for the first time you take the bung off and you sniff inside and if it's sweet it's more than likely a decent fresh good quality cask and furthermore the chances are that if a distillery has gone to the expense of importing the casks whole then the chances are there are better quality wood to start with wood that's been harvested and air dried to hold on to these valuable flavor chemicals found in the wood and not kiln dried for fast results speedy results which greatly diminishes the range of flavor influence a cask can have on a whiskey so if you're a bourbon producer in the usa and technically you can only use a yeah, in fact by law you can only use a cask once for bourbon then you've got to discard it and your bourbon's only going to be in it for about two years you don't want to be spending a lot in casks so you want them as cheap and as fast as pos possible you want great big industrialized production lines and easy access timber forests where the trees have grown super quick and have less flavor in the wood literally less flavor in the wood and then in preparing these these staves for forming into casks they're put into baker's ovens that's what they look like they roll through baker's ovens to be dried out super fast and it it's always smells lovely because it's like turning fresh coffee into instant coffee it's exactly the same sort of shorthand process you know we're all coffee drinkers most of us we prefer the the fresh ground beans ground beans because you get more flavor range and more satisfaction from it you don't want to, you can have a spoonful of instant coffee if you want but it's just not the same it's the same with casks the fast produced cheapy cheapy casks that get turned into flat packs to fill up shipping containers then they have to be reassembled and if you're lucky you've got an experienced cooper doing it and if you're unlucky you've got a 
production line full of machinery. And then thereafter, a lot of your casts are just leaking and wasting your precious liquor. It's a false economy. See any distillery that doesn't have access to a, to a cooper. They're struggling. They're really struggling to do what they need to do to make a premium product. End of. A good cask influence enhances not just the flavour of the whisky after years maturing in a glass, but the sensation intensity, the sensation balance, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, savoury, and the form of the whisky, the fullness of the arrival, the, big, the, the, the depth of the development and the finesse of the finish. You cannot get that from cheap wood, inferior wood, kiln dried wood. This is why I tend to look more and more towards wine casks, European wine casks for maturing whiskey. Once you've rinsed out the overt wine influence, um, because quite a number of casks coming from the USA are, are really just spat off a production line and that's fine if you're going to be creating just a generic off the shelf and on the bar um, liquor that people are going to have as a mixer not a problem but when it becomes an expensive single malt you need better wood and there is better wood there's plenty of better wood out there it just costs more money and see good American oak from from a good location properly harvested, properly air dried for several years. What a difference that makes, Malt makes. Seriously, when you taste the difference, you'll never forget it. And this is why the quality of casks are so important. Because without casks, whiskey is nothing. It's nothing. It's just a new make spirit. It's just basically a boutique gin. That's what it is. Without the cask influence. I'm Ralphie, hope you've enjoyed this extras. I know I finished on a, quite a controversial note there, but I try and you make spirits. Um, and they're nice, simple, two-dimensional little beings, and unfortunately these days too many of them are over-distilled. They've got no personality. Just at a moment in time when people's palates globally are appreciating personality and character more and more and more. But what do I know? Like yourself, malt mates, I'm an enthusiast. And we've all got to make our own journey. Take what we can from the industry and make sure we just don't swallow all the information hook, like and line and sinker because it's our journey, our singular journey. The more information we have, the better the quality of our journey. Simple as that. The better equipped we are to make that journey. Thank you for watching. I shall be back again soon. I've probably with a 13-year-old whiskey with a wee mousy thing on it. Quite enjoying it. See you soon. Bye-bye.